Hi, I'm Kyle Probert. That's me on the left from APT Specialist Hydraulics and Training. We specialise in fluid power centric professional services for all sorts of end users. We promote the safe and efficient use of fluid power systems. On the right is Alan, my business partner, and we're backed up by a full team of dedicated staff that help us to help you look after fluid power systems. In this presentation, we're going to talk about what is simulation and simulation in general, how is simulation of hydraulic systems done, and why do we use simulation in hydraulic systems, such as functionality, energy consumption and efficiency, system analysis and training. So what is simulation? Simulation is based on, bot on models. So these models are an imitation of the operation of a real world system. We take all of these models, components, and we assemble them to represent a system. Generally, the models are formed around a mathematic formula and information and are continuously calculated during the simulation process. In our hydraulic simulations, they are represented as symbols on a schematic. We have many different types of simulation that we might be exposed to in the world. Fluid fl flow through a valve or a pipe, and we, we do this to show efficiency or maximum theoretical output, pressure drop, anything like that. Structural, so for strength or safe working limits, fatigue life, and to help us reduce over design and extra weight. Electrical distribution, sometimes used for increased efficiency of the system, modeling of different load systems, um, load sharing scenarios, and also for switching permits or switching programs. Vehicle road conditions. It's often hard to create, take a car and, and get five years life out in, in a short period of time. So what we do is we put it on a simulator to simulate those road conditions in a very short or a condensed time frame. We probably well know flight simulation used for teaching pilots and crew on how to, an airplane operates. And the reason that we do this is not so much to teach them the finite points of operating the, the aircraft, but so that we can put them into abnormal situations in a safe manner. So the simulation of hydraulic systems can be used for functionality or proof of concept, energy use or efficiency, so we can analyze what that system is going to do, system analysis to show safety in support of an FMEA or an other an detailed analysis. Detailed modelling to look at how a system might react, um, pressure drops, pressure, pressure flow graphs, anything else like that. And also for training. Simulation models in our hydraulic systems are based on real world data. So this real world data comes from OEMs. So we might get that information from the likes of Rexroth, Parker, anyone else that manufactures valves and pumps and all those sorts of things in the forms of their data sheets. We might get it from end users, so experience based type of information. We can also get it from testing. Now while simulation is a very powerful tool, it is only a tool. So this tool still needs to be backed up by experience to help validate or to verify that the results are plausible. So using simulation for functionality, here's a case study of a jack-up barge that was used in the local area. So the jack-up barge has four legs. Each leg has four cylinders for motion, operated in pairs. Pressure and flow for the cylinder is dependent on what the leg is doing. So there's different modes depending on whether we're lowering a leg from a floating barge to the sea floor, or if we're lifting the barge off and out of the water. Now depending on whether the barge is half floating or semi floating, also depends on how much weight the legs need to lift and whether we need to use two or four cylinders to actually lift the barge. So if we're lowering the legs or if we're lifting the legs off the sea floor, in this, in this case the cylinders operate in pairs to give us continuous motion. So as one cylinder extends, the other one retracts, ready to engage and push the leg down or lift the leg up. So this is a very light load but high flow up or operation. Now because the cylinders are differential cylinders, when the cylinders are extending we don't need very much pressure at all, but when they're retracting we need a bit more pressure because they are a differential cylinder 
and the area is smaller in that end. Once we're actually lifting the barge out of the water, we need to use all four cylinders together. We need maximum force to actually drive those cylinders. So in this case, we're using a lot of flow and high pressure to extend the cylinders, but to retract the cylinders, we're only using a small amount of pressure and a, and a smaller amount of flow. So in this case, there's eight solenoids just to control the direction of the cylinders. So we can see there, in those pairs, we've got eight solenoids across the bottom there on four DCVs. To control pressure in the system, there are 10 solenoids which control pressure. And you can see them laid out across all the different pumps there. Now some of them control operating or compensator pressure, others control relief valves. Now because we're using different pumps for different scenarios, such as extending, retracting, high flow or low flow, we've got a further eight solenoids to select which pump delivers flow to which sets of valves. So for our eight functions, each function requires nine or 11 solenoids, depending on which pump is being used. There's five pumps, eight solenoids to select which pump, 10 to select the, the pressure, and eight solenoids to se select cylinder direction. So when we line all of that up, there's a 640 possible combinations which can control one cylinder. Imagine trying to work out by hand, manually, which combination is the right combination to make it work. There is hours and hours of work involved. By using the simulation software, we can quickly put in all the parameters and test our, our simulation. By energizing or de-energizing cylinders or solenoids, we can quickly see what is actually happening, what speed is happening, and what, what pressure we've got selected. Another example is simulation to prove the energy efficiency of a, of a system. So we're looking at a bolter miner. Now, on this bolter miner, there are four pumps, two of which are load sense. The total installed motor power is 132 kilowatts. Now in this case, we're not so much looking at energy efficiency, but total energy draw and how much we actually need. Now the machine in question was a minor boulder and the customer wanted to add a breaker function, hydraulically driven. So the breaker function operates at 300 bar at 40 litres a minute. When we add that up, that's only about an addition of 20 kilowatts to the system. So the, the breaker itself only needs 20 kilowatts to operate. Normal power requirements for the system as installed previously was 90 kilowatts. So out of our 132 kilowatts, we should have had power to spare. Now the decision on which pump to operate the breaker off was critical to the operation of the system. Now in, in the case of this machine, the load sense pump normally operates at 200 bar. So we decided to put it on the load sense pump and we moved that normal operating pressure from 200 bar to 300 bar, still within the safe limits of the operation of the pump. There's still plenty of flow available and every, the system operates as normal. Our pump new flow output goes to 250 litres a minute, up from 210. But the key point here is that our operating pressure goes from 220 to 300 bar. So this is an increase in power requirement of 47 kilowatts. More than double the actual power required for the breaker function and a lot more than is required or a lot more that is available for the machine itself. By using simulation, we can quickly check the results so we can see directly what the power is being drawn of the electric motor. We can quickly change from pump to pump and work through the, the what if scenarios as to what happens on each system. And we can also see what other effects happen. So if we rob flow, if we increase or decrease pressure, what else might happen to that system and what goes wrong more than anything else. We can use simulation for detailed analysis. So detailed analysis is really important on safety critical functions. 
Now, sometimes we have to get into that very, very nitty gritty stuff, back pressures, tank pressures, and often these things can be damaging the systems. The other things that are really important are pressure spikes or transient pressure spikes, which are really, really fast spikes that happen in a system. These happen in long walls, anything with high flow stopping or changing direction rapidly, and also in um, high, high flow tank filling scenarios. So as we look here, we've got a reservoir that's been built that we are simulating the, the, what's going on. We are calculating what happens as the system is shut off to see what the expected pressure rise and what the transient pressure might be. It also shows any other irregularities that happen as this is occurring. In this system, every component is being recalculated every two milliseconds. If we need to, we can change this faster so that it's calculated every half a millisecond. So this is a very, very high resolution. Now in this system, we can see that the pressure rises and when we shut it off, we get quite a few transient spikes that happen through the system. Now in this case, those spikes are quite damaging to the tank itself. So quite an important part that can be proven what's going on in the system without endangering either people doing this in a real world application or the equipment which might be expensive to repair. We can use FMEAs and FMEAs are really, really strong to show us what happens with the system and what might go wrong, what the downstream effects are of a component. By using simulation to back up our FMEA, we not only add strength to our data that we collect and that we analyse in that case, but it also allows us to go through the what-if scenarios quite a lot quicker and with a lot more detailed information. So what happens if a relief valve is set high? What happens if a counterbalance valve is set low? What happens if we change a hose for the wrong size hose? What happens if we change the input power requirements? All of these things can be quickly detailed and analysed before we actually build the machine. We can use simulation of hydraulic systems for training. Now this is a really, really strong concept as well. Once we've done our design and we've proved our design concept and verified it, then we do our FMEA and we prove the concept of the system, what's going on, how it might work. Then we can use all of that data for training. Now as our learners, and typically the people that are trying to work on these systems, need to see how a system works. So in this case what we've got is we've got the remote control, and that's a picture of what the actual remote control is, and then we've got a small part of the circuit to show what happens. In the simulation, the simulation can operate and show as you push buttons on the remote, the pump turns on, and then we operate the function, we can see that the DCVs operate, the cylinder goes up, and how it all works. Now this is a really, really strong teaching tool for people that struggle to understand how circuits work or who have, very, have a very low exposure to hydraulic systems. So where has it been used? Just about everywhere. We've used simulation for the jack-up barge, We've used it on very, very old winders, so proof that an old system can actually work and that it can actually comply with current, re current requirements. We've used it on valve banks, complex systems that need to be proven that they work and that they are safe to use, and to prove that um, faults and energy consumption in a system, where the faults are coming from and why the faults exist. So this is a brief overview of how simulation can be used in the analysis of hydraulic systems. If you'd like more information, please do get in touch with us or visit our website hydraulictraining.com.au.